Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor DM. For now. And I'm Deathbringer. Forever. Click on the bell icon to subscribe. In last week's video, I cautioned everyone not to be beguiled by Wizards of the Coast. Hasbro employs very smart people, the best law firms, and the best PR firms in case there's a disaster like what we've been seeing in the Dungeons & Dragons world over the last couple of weeks. Over the last week, Wizards has given us a new statement as well as an updated OGL, but can we trust them? That is the subject of this week's video. Before we get to that, I just want to say, if you contact Wizards of the Coast, please do so respectfully. It doesn't matter whether it is a part of the design team or part of the corporate team. We can be angry at the company, but we don't want to be angry at the people. So any communications you have with Wizards of the Coast should always be respectful. With that in mind, let's take a look at the most recent apology by Wizards of the Coast, as well as the OGL 1.2 draft. You might ask what makes my analysis any different. I teach college level argumentation and persuasion. The techniques I point out are the ones I teach to my students. So let's take a look at the text, a working conversation about the open game license. Hi, I'm Kyle Brink, the executive producer on D&D. It's my team that makes the game we all play. It's informal. He says hi instead of hello. He introduces himself by name. Now we're dealing with an actual person instead of a, a faceless company. D&D has been a huge part of my life before I worked at Wizards and will be for a long time after I'm done. My mission, and that of the entire D&D team, is to help bring everyone the creative joy and lifelong friendships that D&D has given us. So this is called intrinsic ethos. It's a way to build trust with your audience. Kyle is saying, hey, I'm one of you. I'm not just an executive. I'm also a person that plays d and I'm here today to talk about a path forward. First, though, let me start with an apology. We are sorry. We got it wrong. Well, this is a big improvement. The short declarative sentences in separate paragraphs make for an unambiguous apology. So far, so good, but this is where the train starts to leave the tracks. Our language and requirements in the draft OGL were disruptive to creators and not in support of our core goals of protecting and cultivating an inclusive play environment and limiting the OGL to TTRPGs. This is a classic textbook case of the high ground maneuver, and it works like this. It's a way to diffuse possible objections. You frame yourself as the adult in the room, and everyone else is small thinkers. So you move from the specific to the general. See what he did? He moved us from the OGL, which is what we care about, to inclusivity, which is an unassailable principle that everyone who is in gaming would agree with. And in doing this, he's attempting to shift our attention and diffuse our anger. He's also sticking to that language that it's a draft copy of the OGL, which we know is not true because Kickstarter admitted the contract was real. I don't know if he's doing this for legal purposes or if it's a case of repeating a lie so much it'll eventually become true, but there is no way OGL.1 that was leaked to the press was a draft copy in any way. That was the real deal. He goes on to say, starting now we're going to do it a better way, more open and transparent with our entire community of creators. We'll listen to you and then we'll share with you what we've heard. After you review the proposed OGL, you will be able to fill out a quick survey. Much like the Unearthed Arcana Playtest Feedback Survey, it will ask you specific questions about the document and include open form fields to share any other feedback you have. This is very clever. It's a technique called assuming the sale. Like when a car salesman says, are you planning to finance with us? And do you need the car today? They're framing the conversation as if you'd already agreed to buy the car. Look at this language. Starting now, we're going to do this a better way. We'll listen to you, then share what we've heard. It assumes you've already agreed to participate in their poll. Then he bullets a bunch of stuff no one really cared about. Minis, dice t-shirts, paid DMing services, consulting VTTs. This is called laundry list persuasion, where you bury your failed position behind a list of other stuff. Almost half the letter is Wizards of the Coast saying they're going to give you things that you already had. And I have to hand it to Kyle. This is A-plus level stuff. No doubt this was run through corporate and carefully vetted by an outstanding PR firm. The point is not to convince you 100%. It's just to move you, to prime you, to get you to make the first step toward reconciliation. Take our survey. 
Then once you take that step, you'll be more inclined to take more. They also want to redirect your anger. They want you to vent in the survey instead of putting them on blast on Twitter, Reddit, and Facebook. So the Washington Post and CNBC don't write any more articles about the chaos that is currently going on in our hobby. Now let's talk OGL Draft 1.2. There's certainly some improvements here. It says draft in huge letters, which the previous OGL did not do. It says the core mechanics are licensed to you under the Creative Commons Attribution License. There's no licensing or registration, financial reporting, no royalty payments, and they cannot license your work, so they can't steal your stuff. Now for the problems. Bob Worldbuilder points out the Creative Commons license excludes content like spells, monsters, and classes, so this proposed draft is not as generous as the original OGL. There is also a vague morality clause, item 6F, no hateful content or conduct. We have the sole right to decide what conduct or content is hateful. So what is hateful or discriminatory will be decided by wizards in secret. And as a person who is opposed to discrimination, this seems like a good thing on the surface. But what exactly do they mean by obscene? It's not defined. This is the book of erotic fantasy. It's published under the OGL. Would this be considered obscene? I don't know. And it covers not just printed material, but your in real life behavior. What if your dungeon master wants to moonlight as an exotic dancer? I know you probably don't want to think about that, but what if they did? And what if they wrote a magic item or a monster for a third party publisher? Wizards could then take the license from that publisher? It seems like overreach to me. And it's disingenuous. It's done under the pretense of protecting the brand. But as Ryan Dancy, architect of the original OGL, points out, trademark law already protects brands. And OGL 1.0a gives them more protection. This isn't about brand protection, no matter how many times they say it is. Item 9e, governing law, jurisdiction, and class action waiver. This license and all matters relating to its interpretation and enforcement will be governed by the laws of the state of Washington, and any disputes arising out of or relating to this license will be resolved solely and exclusively through individual litigation in the state or federal courts located in the county in which Wizards has its headquarters. Each party here to irrevocably, ooh, they understand the word irrevocably, waives that right. My father was an attorney, and there's an old attorney joke that goes like this. A good lawyer knows the law. A great lawyer knows the judge. They want to try cases in their backyard, where they're going to be familiar with the judge hearing the case. And large corporations contribute to the political campaigns of governors who appoint judges. And 9G, both you and Wizards waive any claim to a jury trial. Again, they may know the judge, and you don't. That is ridiculous. My father would never allow me to sign a contract like this. Other problems. They still want to deauthorize OGL 1.0a. When it was created, open source licenses did not have to contain the word irrevocable. And over 1,500 publishers have now signed on to the ORC license. Why? Because they don't trust Wizards of the Coast. So here's our plan of action. First, by all means, take the survey. But as the rules lawyer points out, the survey does not ask if we prefer OGL 1.A. It does give you a box where you can write a response, and it should be, there is nothing to discuss. OGL 1.0A is irrevocable. And don't stop talking about this issue on Reddit, Twitter, or with your friends. That's what Wizards is counting on. Next, follow Ryan S. Dancy on Twitter. He is the architect of the original OGL and has been a real leader on this subject. I trust almost no one, but I trust Ryan Dancy implicitly. Sign the change.org petition to support OGL 1.0A. 20,000 people have already signed, but there are 100,000 subscribers on this channel. If you haven't signed yet, click the link below and add your name. It only takes a minute. Continue canceling your D&D Beyond subscriptions and tell your players why you're doing so. For legal analysis of Kyle Brink's letter and the new OGL draft, check out The Rules Lawyer and Rule of Law. Both are actual lawyers. They're not intellectual property attorneys, but my IP attorney sends me their videos all the time for homework, so they're very good, and I subscribe to both of them. And check out Roll for Combat. They have an extended interview with Mr. Dancy that explains exactly how the OGL was created, and it's worth your time to hear it from the source. Later this week or early next week, I will present my Reviled Society Supercut 
with all the Wizards of the Coast content scrubbed from it. It's an entire urban-based campaign for you to steal. Check out Dungeon Craft on Facebook and Patreon and get my non-OGL games Deathbringer and Eldritch Hack at the link below. See you soon, stay the course, and may all your rolls be 20s. Attention ladies, Deathbringer is now available for bachelorette parties. Morality clause be damned. And you can get my t-shirt below and watch more Dungeon Craft.